It's Monday, and that so happens to be the day that I like to talk about monsters. Hello, and welcome to Monster Mondays. I'm Jeff Arbuckle, co-host of the podcast Film Seizure that you can catch each Wednesday at FilmSeizure.com or at a number of podcast providers online. This week, we once again go across the Pacific Ocean, but not where we normally go when we do this sort of stuff. No, instead of Japan, we're going to South Korea. Here, we'll discover the host. This 2006 monster film comes from director and co-writer Pong Joon-ho. Now, Joon-ho was fairly early in his career at the time of making this film. This was only the third film he made. However, one thing that quickly became evident from this director is that he didn't exactly do straightforward films within a specific genre. His first film, Barking Dogs Never Bite, wasn't just a comedy, but a dark comedy. His second film, Memories of Murder, wasn't just a crime drama, but a neo-noir crime thriller. The Host isn't just a monster film, but an epic monster film that runs a full two hours and turns out to be something of a comedy as well. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, it was 2013 when his career really started to pick up a whole lot of steam. That was the year his uh, adaptation of a French graphic novel that he called Snowpiercer hit the screen. It starred an international cast led by Captain America himself, Chris Evans, and it landed on many critics' top 10 lists in early 2014. That success led to his follow-up film, 2017's Okja, which uh, found distribution through Netflix. Again, another international cast, this time led by Tilda Swinton, who was also in Snowpiercer, and Paul Dano. Uh, but it's not just an adventure film, nor is it a science fiction film. It's a science fantasy action adventure film. So yeah, Junho continued to play around with twisted genres. But if you recognize the name, it's because he walked away with four Oscars on February 9th, 2020 for his crowning achievement, the dark comedy thriller Parasite. In Parasite, Junho uh, explored class conflict, social inequity, and a wealth disparity in Korea that culminates in a grand overarching eat the rich theme for the film. Beyond the themes explored in the film, it's very important to understand the significance of what Jun Ho achieved that night at the Oscars. Even before the Academy Awards, it became the first ever Korean film to win the Palme d'Or at the Cannes Film Festival, and it won so by way of unanimous vote. Then, at the Oscars, it became the first ever film from South Korea to be nominated in the Best Foreign Language, or what's now known as Best International Feature category. I think that was actually the first year that they changed the name to Best International Feature as well. Um, that was one of the four Oscars won that night. Jun Ho became the first Korean to be nominated for Best Director and only the fourth Asian filmmaker to ever be nominated in the category. He became the second Asian filmmaker to win that award after Ang Lee did so for 2000's Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. The other significant thing about winning the top prize at Cannes was that Parasite became only the third movie to win both the top prize at Cannes and the Oscar for Best Picture. 1955's Marty won both Best Picture and the Palme d'Or, and 1945's The Lost Weekend won Best Picture at the Oscars and tied for the original title of the Palme d'Or, which was just called the Grand Prix back then. Um, another very significant thing that I think changed the game, too, was that Parasite became the first non-English film to win Best Picture, making it, of course, the first film to win both Best Picture and Best International national feature it's that kind of a special movie but it was jun ho's four oscars um that is truly a remarkable feat all done in the same night now technically he does not get credit for the best international feature win as that technically is reserved for the country that won not necessarily the individual filmmakers involved with the direction or production but screw it i'm counting it and i'll tell you why at the Oscar ceremony for the films of 1953, Walt Disney is credited as the only person to walk out of the ceremony carrying four Oscars. But what did he win for? Well, he won for Best Documentary Feature for The Living Desert, 
best documentary short for the Alaskan Eskimo, the best short subject cartoon for Toot, Whistle, Plunk, and Boom, and best short subject, Too Real, as it was called back then, for Bear Country. Now, if you ask me, I'm not sure Disney should get all the credit as those awards are today handed over to the people who actually made the film being honored, not the person who runs the company that released them or produced them. My point is, never in my life, and likely never again, would I ever expect to see the same guy get on stage four times to to accept the Oscars for Best Screenplay, Best Director, Best International Feature, and Best Picture. Maybe, just maybe, someone will make an animated feature that could potentially win Picture, Director, Screenplay, and then Best Animated Feature, but I kind of doubt it. I was truly in awe of Bong Joon Ho's incredible night at the Oscars, and it was not a fluke, and it should never be taken lightly what happened with Parasite. All right, I had to talk about that because uh, this might be a guy who becomes an exceptionally important director for the next many years to come. What we're really here to do is talk about the host. Now, Jun Ho got the idea for the movie after a scandal occurred where an American ordered his employees in South Korea to get rid of formaldehyde just by pouring it down a drain that led to uh, the formaldehyde getting uh, into the Han River and mutated and disfigured fish in the river. Um, that was all he needed for inspiration to make a monster flick. However, because the inspiration came from a true story about that American boss poisoning the Han River, there were some tensions between South Koreans and the American government when that real-life event took place. America has a lot of interest in a large military presence in South Korea, and this led to some believing the film uh, turned out to be an anti-American and um, uh, certainly shows American military folks not really being all that caring towards the plight of the people affected by their poisoning of the water. But I don't think that's necessarily entirely true that this film is really at its heart anti-American. Sure, Americans are portrayed at times as either villains or people covering up things or so on and so forth. But still, none of that stopped North Korean authorities praising the film for sticking it to the Americans. But the reason why I say I don't really think it really is entirely anti-American is that, you know, there's some stuff about the Korean government. Um, that's not exactly portrayed very well in this movie either as they come off as bureaucratic and kind of also not really caring about the stuff going on to the locals or the people who encounter this monster now it might just be a deeper statement than these guys uh than saying that these guys are either dumb or bogged down with process or uncaring i don't know just saying it it does kind of seem like that there is a real life ecological event that happened that is really at the heart of what the story is about um but it's also just a good way to be able to create a monster and it's also a good way to kind of make some statements about bureaucracy and some of the stuff that goes on and how yes there are very weird um and unfortunate at times uh social conditions that are uh kind of levied toward the the Korean people of South Korea. But anyway, much larger uh, story than that. But let's unpack what the movie actually is, shall we? The movie opens with two men in a morgue. The American works for the military, and he actually... <laughs> It's a single scene. It's almost a, uh, a cameo of sorts. Uh, but it's Scott Wilson, who was in The Walking Dead and uh, in Cold Blood. Um, and his assistant, Mr. Kim is ordered to dispose of the formaldehyde in dozens and dozens of bottles that are sitting around and just uh, he just has them directly put it into the sink now mr kim says that this will empty into the han river and the military doctor says yeah i know we're dumping it into the han river <laughs> and he says it in a shockingly nonchalant way but because it's a direct order, Mr. Kim spends most of his evenings in a gas mask 
dumping formaldehyde down the drain. At some point later, two fishermen fishing in the Hun River start to recognize mutated and deformed fish. Later yet, a man mumbling about seeing things under the water decides to jump off a bridge to his own death. Years pass, and we now catch up to the present day 2006, where we meet uh, Park Gandu, who uh, works as a vendor for his father and often sleeps on the job and uh, is kind of typically fairly clumsy in general. He is raising his daughter, Han Xiao. Um, he Bong, uh, who is uh, Gong Du's father, receives a complaint from one of his customers that their squid only had nine legs. Now, he thinks Gong Du ate one of the legs, but Gong Du kind of denies it. However, for being honest, Gong Du is a bit of a loser, and I could see him kind of eating something off of somebody's plate before it gets delivered to them. Uh, but when he uh, delivers some uh, another order of food to some other customers, they spot this black kind of sludgy thing hanging from a bridge before it begins to move and then decides to kind of untangle itself from the bottom of the bridge and falls into the river. It's very clearly some sort of never-before-seen creature. Gangdu throws a beer can into the river, and the creature snags it with a tentacle. Soon, everyone tosses cans into the river to see it eat again, but this time it doesn't. Instead, it gets out of the water and starts running along the riverbank, grabbing people and tossing them into the river. The monster creates chaos and a lot of blood and death, uh, and kind of... Out of being nearby, Gongdu is kind of drafted to help people trapped in a trailer. There's also an American uh, getting in on trying to stop the monster. We find out later that he is a military man stationed there. Um, and it's relatively quickly that we see him get uh, eviscerated by the beastie, uh, one of his arms gets uh, ripped off but as the monster runs uh by the park home it runs by hun xiao and uh, on the way to the river again and grabs her by the tail which is this kind of tentacle tail and jumps into the water with the teenage girl disappearing under the surface of the river soon the military cordons off the area to take charge of the situation and at a public visual gongdu's sister manju uh, comes home from an archery competition as well as gongdu's brother namil uh, the family ends up making a huge display as they mourn the loss of han xiao and later that night the people here in this quarantine building are rounded up to be to be transported elsewhere um and placed Placed into a kind of like a hospital quarantine but when gangdu says some of the creature's blood splashed up in his face when he uh hurt the uh, tentacle tail with a with a heavy sign uh he's rounded up in a biohazard bag and transported with the rest of the quarantine people that american who was with gangdu to help stop the creature like I said, he lost an arm while being treated, and uh, there are some bumps and bizarre infection-like stuff on his skin that gets a little bit of news coverage. And Gongdu himself is experiencing itchy skin. That night, his phone rings, and it turns out it's Hun Sao calling to uh, try to get in touch with somebody to get rescued. The Park family, knowing she's alive, now plan to find her. So we soon learn that the creature uh, isn't always killing all the people he captures, at least not always right away. He's got this kind of drainage pipe hideout that he stores people like a pantry. Now, sometimes, um, you know, the, he delivers the, the people that he's going to eat later still alive. Sometimes they're already dead, uh, but he's he's kind of stashed these people away. And this is where, yes, indeed, Han Xiao is not dead and is still kind of uh trying to uh, figure out a way out when she um sees somebody get dumped into the drainage pipe she takes the phone and uh sees if it's still working so that she can try to call her father or her grandfather or somebody as gong dude tries to explain how he knows his daughter is still alive he did see the monster spit back out people it ate um into a sewer along the river However, the people he's telling this to just think it's a delusion. Later, the Parks, with the help of a local group of gangsters, um, 
end up staging a daring escape from the hospital where they've been quarantined. And there is kind of a funny scene where the gangsters now want payment for helping out and basically just end up taking all of uh, the the grandfather's um, credit cards and all of his uh, uh, pin numbers, which just happens to be one, two, three, four on all of his cards. Um, it, it's a pretty funny scene, but um now the parks then bribe their way back to the Han River and use the sewer to uh, use a map of the sewer rather to try to ch- to track down Han Xiao. However, they aren't alone in the sewer. Instead of the monster, we discover that there are two homeless boys trying to stay hidden. The older of the two is Sejin, the younger of the uh, the younger one is Sejo. Now they run into the creature and it captures them and they both get swallowed up by the monster and taken to the drain pipe in the sewer. The creature spits the kids back up, but the older Sejin has died. Uh, but Han Sao is there to kind of help the littler kid and try to help him get out as well. And before heading back out to search again for Han Sao, the creature finds uh, our family and the three men uh, start firing guns at the creature uh, but it doesn't really do all that much good. He Pong uh, wants to finish the creature off, but he runs out of bullets. The creature kills him before escaping again into the river. The parks are captured again uh, by the authorities, and a news report comes in saying that the U.S. soldier who fought the creature in its first appearance and contracted a peculiar virus from its exposure has uh, died from that virus. Later, Namil calls one of his college buddies he used to protest with a lot, and uh, he figures out a way to try to narrow down the search area where Han Sao might be kept. He discovers what bridge she is near, uh, but discovers his old friend sold him out to collect on the bounty from the government. Uh, but Namil escapes, and when uh, we then discover that the American soldier did not actually have a virus. In fact, there is no virus originating from exposure to the creature. It was a way for the Americans to kind of try to cover up everything, um, or at least to quarantine people so that the story can't get out too quickly that there's a giant monster running around. But because Gangdu could prove to be a problem, since it's widely known he had also been exposed to the creature, it's decided to basically give him a lobotomy. But before doing so, he learns from his sister what she learned from their brother. The drainage section of the sewer where Han Sao is. In that sewer, Han Sao has created a rope from old shirts from the old, from the other victims that are collected there. And she plans to use it, uh, for her and Saju to get out. But the monster is still lurking about. And this time it starts to spit out the bones. So he's now eating the people he's collected. But meanwhile, at the hospital, Gangdu does have his lobotomy, but it doesn't take. In fact, I think it makes him smarter. Um, and he escapes by taking a nurse hostage. So we are now headed towards the big finale as Gangdu is at the Wanho Bridge where the monster hides his victims. Han Xiao is included with those victims. Nam Il is on his way by in a taxi where he creates some Molotov cocktails to use on the monster. And, um, after kind of running into the monster, uh, Namju has been, uh, has fallen into a crevasse where, um, she will eventually rejoin the fight, uh, once everybody kind of collects into this area of the sewer. In addition to all that, the military is about to flood the area with a substance known as Agent Yellow to try to kill the monster. Han Sao is able to escape with her rope, uh, but the monster ends up capturing her again and swallows both her and uh, Seju. And shortly after Gangdu arrives in the monster's lair to find a whole bunch of bones of the people that it's uh, eaten. And uh, he sees the monster walk by with Han Sao's arm sticking out of its mouth. And the monster comes ashore right where the protests are happening and where the military is going to release Agent Yellow. Gangdu pulls uh, both Han Sao and Seju out of the creature's mouth, but it is too late. His daughter has unfortunately died. The creature is affected by the Agent Yellow 
So using this to his advantage, the angry Gangdu attacks the creature directly with the help of his brother and sister, and they eventually set the creature on fire, and Gangdu finishes off by impaling it with a signpost. Later on, Gangdu has taken over his father's vendor stand, and after reviving little Seiju after uh, killing the creature, he adopted the kid. As they eat dinner, the TV plays in the background uh, with the U.S. Senate's findings on the supposed virus threat in South Korea. Also, no word of a monster. <laughs> the, their official word was uh, that uh, misinformation caused this crisis. There was no virus, and there was absolutely, definitely no monster created by the U.S. military poisoning the Han River. Now, let's talk about the three things I liked about the 2006 epic monster flick, The Host. First, there is a scene that would come across as almost out of place, but it's also kind of perfect. Um, so it's the scene in which the Park family comes together in the aftermath of the creature attack. Now, Gongdu is kind of this loser guy uh, that is doing what he can to raise his daughter after uh, the daughter's mother abandoned them. Uh, Maju is also um, kind of a loser in a different way as she failed to let the last arrow fly before her timer ran out. Um, costing her a shot at a uh, archery championship. So she only finished third instead of uh, being able to finish first. And uh, Manel is uh, yet another kind of loser who was an activist and a college grad who now can't find work and just basically is out partying. And um, he arrives at the visual um, already pretty drunk and drinking straight out of a fairly large booze bottle. But because Monil is quick to blame Gangdu for being a fuck up, uh, this teeters into a giant display of a family infighting and crying and rolling around on the floor, bawling their eyes out while screaming about the little girl being dead. All the while, there's not a whole lot else going on behind them, but then a cop comes in asking about somebody's Hyundai uh, who is parked where it shouldn't be, and that's happening totally separate and without any regard to the big park family display happening right in the center of this room. Uh, it's brilliantly funny in a scene that should be kind of deeply sad and almost disturbing, but then how do you follow that up? It's nighttime, and uh, the father, He Bong, Nam Il, and Nam Ju are uh, trying to figure out uh, if Han Sao's mother even knows of her fate. And Nam Il looks over to Gong Du to ask him about her mother, and he's passed out on the floor with his hand in his pants, rubbing his dick. I mean, it shouldn't be funny, and it shouldn't work because of the kind of the whiplash of the. Uh, of, of the different tones, but it really helps drive home the idea that this family who will be heroes of this movie are so average that they are almost comically inept. Um, in fact, it's a theme that starts running through the movie. And while there are certainly scary and serious things that will be said or, or that will happen, I mean, this really is a straightforward comedy. So it's not just a monster movie, it's a comedy. So again, uh, you know, we have this guy who likes to play with all of these different genres, really mixing it up again in this movie. Now, to kind of bounce off of that, while the movie also does have a ton of extremely funny things in it it's also got some pretty heavy stuff in it too all this movie is uh you know to uh, all this movie is is basically to find and save a not dead han sao only for it to be too late and she dies just as her father has arrived to save her that's incredibly unfortunate it does play into the concept that what really killed the girl is not so much that gong du was late uh, or that the monster even exists, but that bureaucratic ineptitude and an imperial cover-up to hide what happened in the first place is the cause for everything. There's a beautiful scene with uh, He Pong trying to explain to Nam El and Nam Ju why Gong Du is the way he is. He talks about how he had to be hungry when he was younger due to their father's own 
poor parentage and he got beaten up pretty badly once and it led to him being kind of clumsy and has bouts where he just has to sleep and so on plus now that he might have to face the fact that his daughter is dead his siblings really need to be nice to him and it's a great scene that ends with the hilarious line about how he knew from Gongdu's farts if he was going to be in a B minus condition or an A plus condition that day. That joke lands, but so does the incredible heart of explaining why this goofball is goofy. As much of a comedy as this movie is, it's still got a few moments that have real dramatic impact making it a great film overall with a perfect balance of monster movie, goofy comedy, and a touching story of a family that is... uh, There's nothing remarkable, really, about this family. Even the remarkable things about the family end up falling short. You know, uh, uh, you have a guy who's a goofball, but he's trying to be the best father he can be um, as a single parent, no less. As brilliant as the other son is he can't get a job as wise as the father seems to be. He just has this little snack bar Um, as great as the daughter is at being um, an archer. She screws up the opportunity to become a champion. So it's an interesting uh, story of a family as well as being a monster movie and a comedy. And third, the monster is really cool. I mean, we think of giant monsters, and aside from King Kong and Mighty Joe Young being big apes, we typically think of something approximating a dinosaur, like, I don't know, like Godzilla. You know, maybe we'd get a dragon or a giant squid or octopus, but it's usually a Godzilla-like dino monster of some sort. This monster is this kind of amphibious, long-tailed fish creature um, that swims uh uses its tail as a tentacle um it's it's a fast runner it's a fast swimmer all of that stuff um that's nice and different and it certainly looks like no other monster i've ever seen in a movie um and this movie was made on a low budget but aside from it looking like a 2006 movie the computer animated fish monster looks really good um i believe it's running along the riverbank and grabbing people and throwing them out of its way and it looks like it has weight to it as well and what's really cool too is that the monster shows up about 13 minutes into the movie it wastes no time whatsoever getting to the good stuff it's not bogged down by the story with the human side of it it gets to the point and rolls with it and it helps make this movie feel and seem kind of shorter than it really is um you know where it is a full two-hour movie but you're locked in the entire time oh and the best thing about this low budget monster movie we see this pretty good looking monster in broad daylight almost all the time this movie is not afraid of showing the monster with potential flaws in the cgi no they had faith in their creation and they let it be seen in bright daylight for everybody to see what they had faith in it's a it's a great thing that uh, unfortunately happens too often with monster movies made over here is that there's so much budget, but yet they still don't want to show the creature in the daytime. Uh, not the host. Uh, they'll show it to you in broad daylight. That wraps up this week's Monster Mondays. You can catch new episodes of Monster Mondays each Monday at FilmSeizure.com. Don't forget to follow Film Seizure at Facebook, Threads, Instagram, and Blue Sky. You can also subscribe to Film Seizure to get both the Film Seizure podcast and the Monster Mondays podcast at your favorite podcast providers, as well as YouTube. You can also check out my website, BMovieAnima.com, to read new reviews every Friday morning. Next time, we've got Peter Cushing, Brooke Adams, and a whole heap of zombie Nazis in 1977's Shockwaves. Until next week, stay spooky.